So welcome again tonight to the World Life Schools Ministry. The lesson that we're doing tonight is called <clears throat> The Power of Knowing Who You Are. We covered this one the other week, but there was only a, a few here. But uh, it's, it's, it's a different printout. You just have two because there could be a few couple of two or three th- more things added to it. Usually when I do a study, every time I go to it, there's something new, something to add to. So sometimes when you get a paper, it's not exactly that's what's on the uh, overhead here but if there's anything uh, scriptures or anything that's not on your sheet just write in the reference then you can you look at it later in your bible and read it in it if you so wish uh, as i say it's called the power of knowing who you are the most important thing to any believer is knowing who you are in other words knowing your identity in the natural sense if a person doesn't know their identity they don't know who they are they don't, they don't know what they have they don't know what they can do. The, 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 a person could have trained them, could be a very high, highly skilled person, but through the loss of memory, don't know who they are. Neither can they perform what they did perform. And, and on the other hand, some people, you've seen it, sometimes you see films that, that are according to two stories, and somebody gets a bang in the head or was involved in an accident and they're away in some other part of the country, and nobody knows them, they don't know who they are, they have lost their identity, they have no identity whatsoever. Maybe they were a person that was hard to live with, a very hard person, but the next thing is because they've lost their memory, they've lost, and the next thing, the best person, <laughs> not only what he could wish for, because their whole demeanor has changed, everything. Everything is changed and it's all subject to their identity. So it's important that we know who we are and that we we know who we are in Christ. It's important for us to know what Christ done, what took place when we were born again and what happened on the inside of us. It's very important that we have a proper perspective of our identity, of who we are. You know, just as as a run up to this here, when Jesus tempted by the devil, most things you hear the devil saying, his opening statement was usually this, if thou be the Son of God. That's questioning his identity. And that's what happened to Jesus all through his ministry. He was identity was questioned. His natural brothers, other brothers and sisters that Mary conceived after that, questioned him. When he performed miracles, his identity was under a question again. This is only Joseph's son. He's only the son of a character. Identity. When he hung on the cross, one of the malefactors turned and said, If thou be the Son of God, come down. Continually being hit with that, but thank God Jesus knew who he was. And people can accuse you, people can try to put anything off onto you they like, but as long as you know that you know that you know that you know who you are in Christ. You see, it's no different to what he done with Adam and Eve. The very thing that brought man into sin in the first place was because they didn't fully know who they were. The devil said, God doesn't want you. Hath God said, for a start, he hit them with half God said. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Then he said that, you know, the reason why God doesn't want uh, you to eat of, of, of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil is because you'd be like him. Who did God create them like in the first place? They were created after him and his likeness and his image, but they were not aware of that, or at least they weren't aware of it uh, to the extent that they should have been aware. God was meeting with them every evening. He came that evening after the sin. There's no reason to suggest or believe that God didn't meet with them every evening. And he was revealed revealing himself to them and he was showing himself to them he came to share his heart with them so they hadn't reached the full point as to knowing who they were but they hadn't reached the full point that i'm as like god as i possibly can be what the devil the devil got them to do is to try to put lack into their heart and the only way you can put lack into a person's heart is by showing them something that they haven't got. Telling a person they have lack doesn't uh, do anything for them. But tell a person that loves a, a big television that, that, that the next door neighbor has one twice as big. Lack starts to come then. Covetousness starts to come into the heart. And because they feel lack, because it's keeping up with the Joneses, they get one 
twice as big as that again. That's how you put lack and desire for something into somebody else's life. It's to show them that they, something that they haven't got. So the devil showed them, as he put it, something they hadn't got. But in reality, they already were like God. They were, were learning every evening how that works out, how that how they had to live that out. They were learning that from God. But the devil come and got them to a desire to be somebody who they are already were and as we go through this here you'll see that possibly uh, you know somebody <laughs> or yourself at some time has sought something from god that god's word says you already have sought to be something that god's word says you already are but the thing is if i'm if i'm seeking to be to become to have something that god has already says i, I am or i have what i'm effectively doing i'm telling my own heart i don't have it i'm not there yet so i'll seek it and if it doesn't work out for me i'll call 50 people together to, to fast and pray that'll get it and instead of doing good you're drawing 50 or 60 other people into your unbelief for what you're speaking out of your mouth unbelief if i'm speaking contrary to what the word the word of god says it's unbelief i don't believe it and the harder i try the further i'm going to get into unbelief the way to approach it is god your word says i am i don't honestly see that i am but show me come from a position that you are not that you're going to be not that you're going to get come from a position that you already have you already are and it's just going to manifest in your heart and in your life so we'll just start at last you said when you realize who god has made you you will walk in supernatural victory. That's a tall statement. But there's many who want to walk in supernatural victory. And they're going about it many in many different ways. Globetrotting the world. Trying to find the anointed of God to impart something into them. But you know, there's only one way to, be, to become and to walk in supernatural power continually. You can get a touch in a prayer line, but you can't get your heart changed. That's a process. That happens when you put your heart into things. When you realize who God has made you, you will walk in supernatural victory. Second Corinthians 3 and 18 from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. As I read that verse, you know, this verse establishes a principle that we become what we behold. If we look on the sins of our outer selves, we will be uh, enslaved to those sins. But if we behold the glory of the Lord within us, we will reflect that glory in our actions. So the question really there is, what are we looking at? As regards our own work with God, am I looking at myself, at my efforts, at my failures, where I've fallen short, where I've got uh, the victory, where I've done things right, where I've done things wrong? Are we looking at that? Because if we are looking at that, the same principle applies. Whatever we behold, we become. We'll stay that way. Acknowledging our sin uh, as regards, uh, I'm not saying that you ignore sin, but you do not make it a principle of your life that you're a sinner trying to get right. You're a person who's right, who's wanting to establish thing that you that you don't sin approaches from the position of what christ has already done of who you already are of what he has already done in your born again spirit and as you begin to behold that in the word of god as you begin this mirror that is talking about here in second corinthians 3 and 18 is the word of god it is not a natural mirror if i was to pass a mirror around a natural mirror around each one here tonight if dorothy looked in the mirror first, who would she see? Who would you who would who would anybody see? As if it round different. Then the mirror didn't change. The mirror reflected what was looking into it. And if the ladies are putting on makeup, you wouldn't chance where your lips are or your eyes especially your eyes if you're putting eyeshadow on or anything like that there. You would want to look in the mirror. The gentlemen would want to Look in the mirror to comb their hair or whatever. Shave. It's advisable to use a mirror because it would give you a true reflection of what's looking into it. But we're talking here about not a natural mirror, not what the natural eye sees, but we're talking about looking into the Word. What the Word of God shows me who I am. 
Everything the Word shows me that Jesus is, it's me. Jesus didn't come to make a wee clone. He came to replicate himself in me. And in my born-again spirit, I'm exactly, exactly the same as Jesus. Fully righteous, holy, acceptable, beloved of God. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. God wants to show us who we are. And we don't see with our natural eyes. We see in the natural mirror with our natural eyes. And it gives us a reflection. You see, you've never seen your own face before. It's impossible. You cannot look into your own face. You can look into mine, whatever benefit that is. But you can't look at your own directly. You have to trust the reflection that the mirror gives you. That that's you. Quite rightly so. If you didn't trust it was you, there'd be something wrong. You need to go to, well in our case, we need to be, uh, well here we're supposed to be Daisy Hill or whatever else. You need to go and see about ourselves. If we we see somebody else. It's not mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the first of them all? And as we look into the word of God, it will give us a true reflection. And we have got to trust because I can't see that in the natural sense. I can't see that in, 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 in the area of my soul. I can't see that I am what the Word of God says. I can't trust my own, uh, my own five senses because that tell me different. But when I look into the perfect law of liberty, the Word of God, and I look into it as a mirror, what the mirror is going to reflect is who God says I am. And just as you have never seen your natural face. You have never seen what you're like inside in your born-again spirit, but the Word of God will show you. But Jesus said the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So they will reveal to you who you are in your spirit. The only thing is, I have got to come into agreement and acknowledge that and say, yes, I don't feel that so like me. I don't feel that's the way I am, my senses, but I believe the Word of God. And when you believe the Word of God and trust the Word of God and keep looking into that mirror and to the glory of God and are being transformed, you start to be transformed into the same image that you see in the Word of God. It starts to come out. See, change isn't coming from outside. It's coming from inside. Look at every bud. Look at the butterfly. It's change doesn't come. And it's not change anyway. It's metamorphosis. It becomes what it was all along. And you only become who you are all along when you focus on God's Word. All change comes from the inside. A bud. I sat and watched our rhododendron bushes. And the, the buds are lovely and green. Then they start to fade. Then they start to open. Then the life of the bloom started to come from the inside out. But the outside had to give way in order for the inside to to come out and the coming out uh, caused the outside the outside this this outside person has got to acknowledge who i am that's a fading of me that's a fading away of me and coming forth who god says i am from the inside out is the manifestation is the new who i already am starting to manifest you see the caterpillar always was a butterfly what it was was still just locked in the inside but when a proper time come it wove into a cocoon and the butterfly started to develop inside the caterpillar. The caterpillar died, its outer self died and fell away and the butterfly came out. Brand new character, totally different, totally different way of thinking, totally different way of acting, to totally different. But it was inside the caterpillar all the time. And any change that we go through, it's not a matter, you know, we think change is, oh, stop doing something that's... Um, it's good to stop. I'm not saying you don't stop, but this is not what it's talking about when it's talking about transformation. Uh, that we, the, we stop doing something and we start doing something that, that's beneficial. We stop doing things that are not beneficial and we start doing things that are beneficial. Um, is, that is character modification. That's modifying your character. That's fine, but character modification is always dependent on your willpower. And your willpower will fail at some stage. Some people can go further than others, but it will fail because there will always be something that your willpower uh, that you are within yourself are incapable of reaching. But when God makes a change from the inside out, it's God that's doing it. It's coming forth out of me and it's manifesting. So this verse establishes that we become what we behold. Believe the Bible is written about you. I read about Abraham. I read about Moses. I read about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Barnabas, Silas. What do you mean it's about me? It's exactly up to date about you. It is the answer to everything. Every problem you have, you can save yourself self a lot of problems if we only learn 
from what these men experienced. How these men received blessing is the same way that I received blessing. How these men went through hard times and were brought through things that God didn't want them to come through shows me I will be the same if I don't avoid the pitfalls that they didn't avoid. Believe that the word of God is written about you. Fill your mind with Philippians 4 and 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But Paul said that. You know, whenever you need strength to do anything, you can claim that. I can do all things. Paul wasn't unique in that sense that God, God was only dealing with him in a certain way. Whatever God made as a promise, whatever God brought forth as a promise in anybody's life, in any part of the Bible, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus meaning they're mine. They belong to me. I put myself in the position of <clears throat> the person in the scripture that received and how they received. And God responds in the same way. So to believe the Bible is written about you. Fill your mind with Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. See yourself in his pages. Romans 15.4 For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What those men went through will give you hope. Read Hebrews chapter 11, the, the, the faith chapter, men who were of hope, men that went, went through their situations in most, most cases were by no means ideal. Someone was sawn asunder, someone was murdered, someone was put to death, someone was burnt, someone was uh, went through different things. The situation wasn't ideal, but yet with all, they're put in, 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 in a chapter in the Bible that speaks of the hope they had, of the faith they had, and how they come through. And to read things of what different things that man has come through. Paul come through a lot of stuff. He was in, he was in, in the deep. He was whipped. He was. Uh, he, he actually says he was left for dead. I believe he was dead, and he was raised from the dead again. And he went through lots of things, pearls in the deep, pearls of, of, of false brethren. Pearls of, of, of different sorts of pearls. You know what he called it? His light affliction, which is only for a moment. Because he looked at it in the light of eternity. Things change when you look at it from the light of eternity. See yourself in the pages for whatsoever things are written aforetime. Whatever was written thousands and thousands of years ago, God seen my dilemma now. And it was put there for my benefit, for your benefit. And as we read and look into the word of God, into the perfect law of liberty, we'll be transformed into the image of that which is shown us. Philemon 1.6 says, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ. Who wants the communication of their faith to be effective? Who wants their faith to achieve what you send it to do? Because that's the communication. Communication is just the delivery from one to another. When you're delivering by your faith to somebody else, when, you're, when you say to a blind person, eyes be open, would you want that to take place? Would you want that to be effective? Would you want that come on to be effective and something and, and the eyes to open of course you want but it says here that your faith becomes effectual when you acknowledge every good thing that is in you inside you not that will be in you that is in you right now that come into you the day the hour the moment the second you receive christ as your savior all the power Everything that Jesus is come on the inside of you. But the thing is, if I don't acknowledge it, if I don't believe it, who else is going to? If I be it's only when I believe it and I acknowledge that my faith then starts to come effectual because what's inside me starts to come out. Faith starts to bring it out because I've acknowledged it's there. It's there. We done a study a while back about gold, how you dig in the you know, you keep digging. The very fact that you know that gold is buried in your backyard and you don't have to know where it is. You're digging and digging and digging and digging until you hit it, until you get it. The very fact that we know that all those good things, all those good treasures, all that Jesus is, is on the inside of me. He's not going to come from America through the anointed. He's inside me now in the same power, in the same extent as he is in any of the big-time evangelists or the big-time teachers. It's the same power, the same authority, the same Christ that's on the inside of me. Those men have just availed themselves of what's there. And if I avail myself 
of what's there, I'd be changed. I'd be transformed by the renewing of my mind. So the communication of, of thy faith may become a factor, and it becomes a factor by acknowledging what's in you already. I am righteous. I am holy. And I sit here tonight with the, with the condition of a stroke, and I am the healed of the Lord. I am not trying to be. I am the healed of the Lord, and that will manifest because God says it will. I'm not saying it will. God says it will. Yet if I keep trusting and keep acknowledging who I am on the inside, you see, on the inside I'm not a cripple. On the inside I'm righteous, holy. And the word righteous simply means just as I should be. And anything that I shouldn't be, it's going to change because God won't. Because God established the righteousness who I am. We think sometimes maybe righteousness is just having a good show, showing a good, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. We should be doing that. But the righteousness that we have is a gift given freely from God because we trust in Jesus. He earned the righteousness. I am a joint heir with him. Everything he has is mine. All of it. Every promise. It's all mine. It's all yours. And the reason why he earned those things, you know, I'm glad I'm a joint heir. Because you see, if you, you know, many people say, you hear them saying it on television and everything, that I have a covenant with God. You do not have a covenant with God. Jesus has a covenant with the Father. If I had a covenant with the Father, then there's conditions that I have to keep to establish that covenant. Jesus, the covenant was made between the Father and the, and Jesus, and he kept every condition and fulfilled every condition of the law, and I'm a joint heir with him, meaning I don't have to. I just trust that it was done in him, and everything I am, I am because of Jesus. God made a covenant with Jesus, and you know the best thing about that is, he'll not break it. There's a possibility I might, maybe more than a possibility, that if we had a covenant directly with God, so we don't have a covenant with God. Our covenant is a joint heirship, a joint covenant with Jesus, it's through what he's accomplished, it's through what he's done, he done it all. So I'm a joint heir. That's what a joint heir means to be a joint. And I'm glad I'm a joint heir isn't something less than 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 uh, just an heir. Just to mean, mean an heir has to meet the conditions, but Jesus has already met the conditions for me. And all I have to do is be in him. I'm in him. So every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Good thing. No bad things. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You know I used to think that that, that part of Beatitudes that, that was just whenever you die go to be with the Lord if you have a pure heart you'll see him. That's not what that's saying. We see God now with our hearts. We look into the perfect law of liberty into that mirror with the eyes of our heart. But if you had a glass of clear water I will say that's your heart it's pure. Pure means there's no contamination. There's nothing else in it. Pure. It's doing what God created it to do. Receive the word of God and receive the things of God and agree with and believe God and trust God. That's what your heart was designed for. And if I look through that, I can see clearly. But what if that glass of water gets murky with other things coming in? What if that glass gets that it's not clear? It becomes difficult to distinguish what you're seeing. That's what it's talking about, a pure heart. When we don't allow things into our heart, that's why God's word tells us to guard our heart. Above all, above all things, guard your heart. For out of your heart proceeds all, 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 everyone. Anything that's uh, connected to life, all the uses of life come out of our heart. We live out of our heart. I don't live out of my circumstance. You choose that, but you certainly live out of your heart. And blessed are the, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's present tense. They shall. The moment we have a pure heart, we purify our heart. Purify your heart, she sinners. Purify them. Sin will become make the waters murky if we can't see the Lord. Or an outline. We're not sure if it's the Lord or not. But to have a pure heart, you're sure, because you have a perfect vision of him. Psalm 103, 1 to 5. This is from the voice translation. O oh my soul, come praise the eternal with all that is within me. Body, emotions, mind and will. Every part of who I am, praise his holy name. O oh my soul, come praise the eternal. Sing a song from a grateful heart and sing and never 
forget all the good he has done. Despite all of your offenses, he forgives and releases you. More than any doctor, he heals your diseases. He reaches deep into the pit to deliver you from death. He crowns you with unfailing love and compassion like a king. When your soul is famished and withering, he fills you with good and beautiful things satisfying you as long as you live he makes you strong like an eagle uh, restoring your youth those are encouraging words that's a very encouraging psalm i would encourage you to read that in whatever translation uh, that you favor uh, personally I, I love the king james but i do look at others to get maybe different clarity and different things read that meditate on that because that has been the source of man is a person's healing. Of man is a person encouraging themselves as David did in the Lord. That is a powerful source of doing that. Psalm 103, especially the first five verse. Proverbs 23 and 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so was he. Constantly focusing our attention on failure will actually draw and cause failure. Remember what we read before, whatever we're focusing on, whatever we're beholding, we become. And if I'm focusing on failure, on how I've got it wrong, of how poor I am, of how miserable I am, of how useless I am, guess what you will be further become. You will be further, you will further become those things because you're beholding them. God's not punishing you by making these things come into your life. I'm doing it myself at what I'm looking at, what I'm believing. You see, faith doesn't work. You get whatever you believe for. And if you're believing that you're miserable, if you believe in that you're not much use, it'll work. <laughs> it'll work. You become more miserable and you become more useless. And it's not because the devil's on, on your back either. It's because of the way you're thinking. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Listen to some of the way God, des God describes you when you are born again. This is the description that God gives himself. You are God's beloved child. Isaiah 49, 15-16. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. Thy, wa thy walls are continually before me. Is there anything in a human sense of relationship that could be deeper than a mother's love for a child. It should be, but sad to say, it's not always the case that it can go wrong. That some mothers they can reject. We've heard of a mother rejecting another daughter because it's not a son, or vice versa, and things like that. That those things can happen in what should be one of the strongest relationships and bonds that there should be, mainly between a mother and a child. There's bonds with fathers, surely, but the, I mean, the mother is the one that carried, the mother is the one that nurtured, the mother is the one who wiped the skin knees, the mother, you know, and there's such a bond between them. But this here, the word says that even in a bond like that, the mother can forget, and not just her infant, her sucking child. She's, it's a child that is still a child. It's not even weaned, but it's possible for that to happen. And God says, yet will I not forget you yet will i not forget you you know i used to read that and think that uh, you're engraving upon the palms of my hands meant that the, the nail scars you know that may no and you know in jewish culture what they had done and this is a jewish book and this is jewish uh, a lot of jewish culture in the bible new testament and all there's a lot of jewish there's an eastern mindset an eastern way of thinking and he was saying here you know when the jews wanted to remember something or they made a commitment to something what they'd done would, would have been tattooed something on on their hands they would have borne it in or they would have like tattooed it in to their hands to remember them to trigger their memory as to what they were it's like tell not your hanky <laughs> you know but then half times you wonder <coughs> what did I tell you that not my hanky for uh, it's like writing down a phone number but not a name beside it whose is that phone number you know so it was just like one of those things uh, that's not the man that Jesus has the scars on his hands but I don't think God needs us to fabricate anything from his word to mean something other than what it means uh, uh, and the walls is speaking to, about is possibly the, it is the walls of Jerusalem and possibly the, the fallen walls, the walls that have been torn down in Jerusalem as a guard for protection that 
God said that is always in the forefront of his mind and his thinking. You are his joint heir. Romans 8, 16. The spirit itself birth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. You know the main way of teaching about Jesus dealing with sin is he took your burden. He didn't. He took the weight of your sin. He didn't. Just take a burden. Just take a weight. Like, give me a Bible to, I've took that sin. I'm only holding it. This word here tells me he became sin. He didn't just take the weight and the burden of sin. He didn't just lift them from my shoulders and put them on his own and take them to Calvary. He became. He who knew no sin. This is very difficult with a lot of evangelicals to, to accept that Jesus, how can God become sin? I can't answer questions like that, but the word of God tells me he became. How he done it, none up to me. It's God that knows how it happened. He who knew no sin became. Didn't take it. Became. Became. He became what I was in order to deliver me from it. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He, knew, he didn't know any sin. It wasn't his own sin. It's not saying that he became a deserving sinner. He took my sin. Not just my place, my sin became my sin. I believe we've got to get that into our thinking. And we've got to push aside our religious mindsets. Because it's important that we know that Jesus became sin for me. But you know, even if we've got that far, that's where most people stop. And this second part among religious people is definitely a no-no. He became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. I am righteous because he took, he became my sin. That's what makes me righteous. I'm not righteous because he took it and carried it. I'm righteous because he became it. I am righteous. Not self-righteous, but righteous in him. I'm acknowledging the good thing that's inside me, that there's a righteousness on the inside of me that was brought into being because Jesus became sin. He knew, knew no sin became sin that I made be made the righteousness of God. You are more than a conqueror. Romans 8:37. Nay, in all these things you are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You are the head and not the tail. Many times you've heard that quote. Is it, is it a reality? You are the head and it, can, it will become a reality as we focus on it. We become what we behold. Start beholding that you are the head and not the tail. Deuteronomy 28, 13. And the Lord said, Make thee and the Lord shall make thee the head. Do you make yourself the head? Do you position yourself as the head of anything? God has made me the head. And to deny that I am the head is to deny what God has done. That to me is not by any stretch of the imagination faith, but unbelief. Not humble, it's unbelief. He shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be, look at this, look at this word, and thou shalt be above only, only. So at no time does God ever bring us from the position of being ahead, to being in the middle, to being a below, to being the tail, to teach us a lesson. Because God says he has made you the head only. What does only mean? There's no other. There's no other position. And if I find myself in any other position, God never put me there. I put myself there through my stinking thinking. They think not knowing and not realizing who I am in him. You're still the head, whether you take up the position of a tail. The only thing is you'll be miserable. You'll be crying to God, God, what do you have me here for? God doesn't have you there. You have yourself there because the only position that he has ever allocated to us is to be the head, is to be above and not beneath. The reason why I'm not beneath because he's made me above. The reason why I'm not the tail is because he has made me the head. You have feel like it all the time? Let you answer that one yourself. Do you feel like it all the time? No, we don't, but it doesn't matter about feelings. It's what God has done, what God has made us. And the more we focus, and the more we focus on what God has made us, the more we come into line with it, and the more we trust him, and the more we like acknowledging that that's one of the good things that's on the inside of me. That I am the head, that I am the tail, that I am a success, that I am not a failure. That God doesn't raise up failures. That God doesn't create failures. That God doesn't make failures. The neck of the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only. <clears throat> and thou shalt not 
be beneath. If thou, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe to do them, you are above only. Above only. If I was above just, it would be possible in some bad days or some down days to be below. But God emphasizes here, you're above only. That's it. Good days, bad days, why you feel like it, whether you don't, you're above. Because that's where I've positioned you. And the word above, uh, above only, it means this and no other. Nothing else has set us in any other position than above only God. And above only. We could go on and on declaring who we are in Christ Jesus. The good news is, not, is there's nothing you have to do to become these things. You already are everything in your born again spirit. God says at the moment uh, you are born again. However, most people live, live below their privileges because they are ignorant of who they are. That's the danger of not knowing who you are. You will live below your privileges because you don't know. You know, uh, emancipation in, in Africa, when, when all the slaves were lawfully set free, a lot of the, the slave owners didn't tell, didn't tell the slaves. And you know, the law and by right and legally they were set free but through ignorance through not knowing they were kept for many years still under slavery and they had to get rid of the mindsets even those that did know had to get rid of the mindsets that they were slaves they were now free whatever that meant in some of the states in america in the early days didn't mean a whole lot but they weren't told you see it wasn't the fact that the law wasn't set in place that the truth wasn't set in place and passed through the Nain uh, Senate, or whatever they call them, over in America. It wasn't that didn't happen. It was that they didn't know. And the thing that causes us to live below who we are is not knowing who we are. Not knowing things. You know, e even until recently, there's been these old men in, in some of these islands off the Philippines and different places who are running about in rags, still in the Japanese uniform, still thinking the war's still on. Surrender was signed years ago. Peace was brought, such as, as the worldly peace is, was brought into place. But here's this man, sneaking around the bushes, because he but put on him never to surrender. <laughs> well, there, he, there he is. But however he survived, I don't know, but he's no man now. And he's still going on and living below. Look at all those years that he could have had because he didn't know. There's a story too of that. The man who greatest uh, desire and greatest dream was to go on a cruise. He wanted to really go on a cruise and he saved up every penny. He saved up everything, everything extra that he had. That he worked on extra work, whatever he had, script and screen screens and, uh, and he gathered up enough money for the cruise and the day come when he went on when he was going on up, up the gangplank of the boat and he had paid his fare and he brought with him a big suitcase full of parties enough to do him last on the whole length of the cruise and there he was every day everybody else was going down to the dining room uh, there was parties at the captain's table and it wasn't Captain Bird's eye and they went to, to parties at the captain's table and there's big spreads for on every night and people eat their fill got as many portions of whatever they wanted uh, as many times as they liked and there he was sitting away down some wee corner somewhere not wanting to be seen boiling a wee drop of water and eating his parties because he hadn't enough the cruise ends lands at Southampton and they're all coming off the ship and the captain's saying his farewell and he stops and he says I don't recollect ever seeing you in the dining room he says I, I hadn't enough money he says man dear it was all inclusive it was all included in the fur you paid and how many Christians are living off porridge when everything is inclusive and what Jesus paid at Calvary, it's all included. The righteousness, the peace, the joy, the happiness, the deliverance, everything is included. So come out of our corners, corners, throw the porridge overboard and come to the captain's table and dine the way God wants you to dine. Come and dine. The master's calling. Come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table all the time. Paid for. It's all paid for in full. Praise God. Second Corinthians 5 17. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold all things are become new. When you are born again, your spirit becomes a brand new species of being that never existed before. If you were if it were possible for, for those that are born again just to trace back when this to when they started when the spirit came into being, that brand new spirit, born again spirit come into being. You know what they find before that? Because old things 
I've passed away to God. There's no old life. There's no old man. There's a memory of what he's left. But the old man's dead. The old man's God. The old man's buried. That's why you're water baptized. To commemorate the death of the old man. Dead. Not only to commemorate the death of the old, but the resurrection of the new. And all things have become new. What's left out of all things? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing that remains of the old Jim Wilson. Apart from a bad memory. Apart from remembering the things. That, that, that's not eroded from our thinking until we do it ourselves. That's why the Bible tells us in Romans 12 to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. What happens is once a person is born again, that's it. I've achieved what I wanted to achieve. My destiny is heaven. I just be battered and bruised, push my way through whatever way I can. Or one of the famous statements, uh, in fact, I, ho- I heard it no later than this morning. Roll with the punches. God doesn't want you to roll with the punches. You weren't designed to take to be a punching bag. To the head, not to the head. Praise God. You are not defined by your past or your pain. You are defined by your heavenly Father. And he defines us. And his word says, as he is, speaking of Jesus, as he is, so are we. That's how I'm defined. Not a failure. Not by my failures. And thank God, not even by anything that I would class as, as a success. But as he is, so am I. He says, you are beloved, you are accepted, you are cherished, you are loved. Ephesians 1, 6 to 7, to the praise of the glory of of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. He has made us accept. Stop trying to be accepted by God. He already accepts you because Jesus has made us accept. This knowledge of who you are <coughs> is the fuel that thrusts you into God's great purpose and plan for your life. You will not be thrust into God's plan and purpose for your life if you don't know who you are. But knowing who you are is the fuel that thrusts you. You know, knowing who you are and believing and acknowledging who you are, uh, knowing who you are is the fuel. Acknowledging who you are is the ignition that ignites the fuel and thrusts you into God's plan, but God's perfect purpose, purpose and plan for your life. That the communication, delivering from one to another, of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledge. acknowledging means owning, confessing, approving grateful of every good thing that is in you in christ jesus discover the who and it would launch and propel you into the do you can only do out of who you think you are be it right or wrong know who you are and it would launch you into the do it just come to mind there you know years ago in the moi there was a man who was brought up abused and brought up the chicken lived and he, 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 he I don't know why he's still living or not. He went into the Maya home, I think, when they found him. His mother put him in a chicken coop. He was brought up with the chickens. You know what he thought he was? He thought he was a chicken. Do you know what he'd done? He clucked. He made the sounds of a chicken because that's who he thought he was. And his actions were in line with who he thought he was. And that will happen. That will happen as far as far out as that. You know, we're not chickens. We are eagles. We weren't made for the chicken coop. We were made to soar in the heavenlies. We are eagles. We are. We were... Uh, designed and created to soar in the heavens above, not cluck on eggs, or not make clucking noise. I think his hands was even not shaped through clone and, and perches and different things. He, he was, as far as he was concerned, done everything the chickens done. He ate their meal, he ate their food, everything. And he thought he was a chicken, but I ain't no chicken. God has designed me for greater things than that. You will end up doing uh, God's will for your life because you have been awakened to who you are in him. Stay asleep to who you are in Christ and you will stay in your present hopeless condition. The enemy is working con- to convince you that you are not who the Bible says you are. Don't know about Jesus. Don't know about Adam and Eve. Don't look down through the ages with different men trying to tell them, you're not. You can't do. Has, have you ever heard that? Have you ever thought that? I can't do what God desires me to do. I haven't got the resources to do what God's telling me to do. I haven't got the money to do what God's telling me to do to do. God tell you? You think God didn't know your present state? You think God hasn't made provision? The one who owns the cattle of a thousand hills, go to the next thousand, he owns them as well. That's a rich farmer Wallace, isn't it? He knows. My question God by my resources, by what I um, what I feel, what I think I've achieved. The best thing to do is just make God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but do it. I'm open, I'm willing. But you'll have to do it. God loves us. God loves when we begin to take him uh, 
regardless of what our situation or conditions are, that we know that he is greater and that he will undertake. If God wants something done, he provides the resources to do it. And the enemy is working to convince you you are not who the Bible says you are. The devil wants to keep you bound in your path, hopeless for your future. But when you understand who you truly are, as a child of God, you will become unstable because it will be in relation to who. Not only who you are, but who you're in. Because who you're in is working on your behalf to perfect that which concerns you. Jeremiah 29, 11, very much quoted scripture. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Praise God. God's thoughts are what his end will be for me, not even mine. For no lying devil can keep me. As long as I can be kept in my past, I don't have a future. I don't have a present. If I keep mulching over the past, the past failures, the past things that I... It caused me that I couldn't feel there's different things falling short. If I stay in that, I rob myself of my present. And if I have no present, I have no future. You've got to leave your past to come into your present. You've got to leave your present and make the journey into your future. You can't skip one because one leads into the other. That's life. If there's no beginning, no birth, there's no growing up, there's no growing through in life, there's a beginning. And God can take us right through from the beginning, right, right through. Because he, you know what? He knew the thoughts that he had for me. And Jeremiah, before, before Jeremiah was even born, he knew the thoughts that he had for Jeremiah. And that wasn't unique to Jeremiah. That wasn't unique to that God knew Jeremiah before he was conceived in the womb. God knew me, God knew you before you were ever conceived in the womb. And his thoughts towards you, towards me, were even away before that. To give me, not just an expected end, but his expected end, what he expects my end to be. God has an end for me because he has a plan, he has a purpose. And in order to live out that plan, to live out that purpose, I must focus on him, that he's the one. Be glad God knows his thoughts. That God's not the doting old God that a lot of religious people, people make him out to be. He knows everything about every praise God. You know, some people behave as if God didn't know about science. That God didn't know about how things work. I think a survey was done one time that they asked these students, do you think God knows anything about uh, radar? No, they didn't think God knew anything about radar. And then the, the question was asked, well, how did we discover anything about radar? Bats. We well, studied bats. You know, how bats could fly at night without sight and they sent out signals and there was even experiments done where bats actually flew through a farm without hitting the blades and they're totally blind and it was the, the radar and the guy says oh yes that, that'd be right but do you think that God created the bat yeah you know the mindset the mindset think that God is not involved in physics that God doesn't know nothing about DNA. Who put you together in the first place from the very smallest of building blocks? When God said, let there be, wow, things come into deep. Uh, no wonder Job says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Things come into being. Your DNA, your cells, every one of your cells. And there's things you're discovering about cells now that are phenomenal. Your poor old God knows nothing about that. All that happened by a big bang. God knows. You know the worst thing about it is a lot of those people that think God's not involved in those things are professing believers or unbelieving believers or one call them believers. They think God's nothing to do with that. Stay away from physics. Those are the subatomic things that God worked with. It's interesting. You know the, tr the real true scientists. Science brings them closer to God because it explains a lot of the things that the Word of God is talking about. But a lot of lying scientists are telling lies to bring about their own agendas. <coughs> true science, those true things, are all created by God. Nothing made that was made was made by him. He made everything. God didn't create out of nothing. He called that which is seen out of that which is unseen. He didn't say it wasn't a, wasn't a reality, but it wasn't seen. Ah. Oh, God knows what he's doing. And even to get to know even something more of the makeup of the human body and to go into a wee bit of deeper depth of what Job said. Job knew nothing. He just knew, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't know the extent of his words. How fearfully and wonderfully we are made. And the discoveries and the breakthroughs, even medical science now, that, that and neurology and neurological things that they're, that, that they're breaking through with is phenomenal. Yet God knew about it all the time. And that's why he gave us instruction to be transformed by the, by the renewing of our mind. 
as we, we renew our mind and our thinking change, that thing changes everything in us. It can change our physical state. Deal with sickness. Deal with a lot of things. God's a good God. Whatever your problem is, God knows and God not only has the answer, God has answered all that. Praise his name. Even the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. Matthew 16 and 18. And I say uh, also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is power in knowing who you are. It starts with knowing you are loved unconditionally by God. That's where it starts. Matthew 16, 18. Thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. The best that a religion can come up with can come up with that one is that Peter was the first pope. That's the best they can come up with. But thou art Peter and upon this rock. What was he talking? The rock of the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's building upon himself. No other foundation can any really man lay than that which has already been laid. Praise God. Then there's power and knowing who you are. And it starts with knowing that you are loved unconditionally by God. The best thing you ever did tomorrow morning, as soon as you get up out of bed, go to the mirror. Say, God loves you. God loves you with an everlasting love. There is nothing God wouldn't do that God hasn't done to prove his love for you. For while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Everything he done, he done for me. You personalize everything you read in the Word of God. And you put you, yourself in as the first person. And meditate on God's Word. And meditate on what God. And, and get to know God. And get to get to get the sensations and the emotions of God that loves you. God loves you. I dare you do it in the morning. I dare you to go on your own. <laughs> uh, don't do it in front of your spouse. Sir. Just get on your own. Convince your own heart first. God loves you. God loves you. God sees and uses at whatever he sees he knows you know what a, any, when it talks about a ransom God Jesus paying the ransom you know a ransom equal what was paid equal the worth of the person that was ransomed do you know what that's saying that God counted me worth the life of his son me worth that because what's ransomed always equals the ransom that is paid or what's valued is always set by what a person is prepared to pay for it. That's why all this art reaches millions of pounds. And to my eye, eye and mindset, it looks more like a person's insides than the right. <laughs> because I don't have any value for it. But a person that has value for art, there's not. Go to an auction. I watch sometimes on TV that, that uh, auction with the auction houses and something that's uh, value set. But there's more than more than enough times the value goes maybe twice as much. Because you get two or three who, two or three who want it and they get into the the bidding mode and will pay what they value it at. God paid for us what he valued at. If any time you think that you're not valued, you're of no worth. Just think about this. God was prepared to give his perfect son for me. Amen. That's fine.